what I'm going to tell you is a story that very few people know. Uh, there might be a handful of people on here who've heard this before. Uh, uh, but essentially, okay, not essentially. All right. When I was growing up, I was young. I was in, and when I was in junior high school, which I guess today is now middle school and stuff, and I was very, very active. Uh, I played, uh, I was a really good little baseball player. Uh, as I got older, I played football and stuff like, and stuff like that. But there was a, there was a point in my life, uh, where I started to, um, I started to get tired. I would be playing baseball or I would be even, even golf, playing golf. And I would get very tired very quickly. And it just seemed to get worse and worse. Uh, and so eventually, you know, and my parents were trying to figure out what was going on with me. And one day, you know, they, they took me to our doctor back in Columbus, Indiana, Dr. Rao. And Dr. Rao was just kind of sitting there and he was trying to figure, you know, he had taken blood tests and all sorts of stuff, not really having any success. And then he, uh, uh, he was sitting and he was just kind of looking at me and he, and he said, do you know that your, uh, your left eyelid is drooping lower than your right eyelid? And I'm okay. What does that mean? And he said, well, it might mean something. And he said, I, he said, I want to send you to a specialist, uh, up in Indianapolis and, uh, well, let's, let's see what happens there. Okay. So he sent me to a specialist named Robert Tether, Dr. Tether up in Indianapolis and, uh, Dr. Tether specialized in neuromuscular diseases. And in particular, he was a, uh, a top expert on a form of muscular dystrophy called myasthenia gravis. And, you know, without getting into long, long stories about this, uh, he took me through some, some tests and very quickly determined that I, in fact, did have myasthenia gravis. And so what ended up happening was I became one of Jerry's kids. If, if you remember when Jerry Lewis used to uh, have his annual telethon for muscular dystrophy. And um, all, so I would be there at the studios during the uh, taping. And then uh, for the rest of the year, you know, what there was, there were often activities and events that were going on. Now, at that time, I was obviously not as as bad, uh, uh, in, in as bad a shape as a lot of the other kids that were there. I mean, there, you know, there are many, many forms of muscular dystrophy. Myasthenia gravis is just one of them. Uh, typically when you see young kids in wheelchairs, uh, they, they are suffering from the, uh, the more well-known version called Duchenne dy dystrophy, which strikes kids very young and they have a very short life. Um, but, uh, fast forward into my story, uh, once they de determined what I had, um, there was a big education process in this. One of the, one of the things was that, uh, that they said that, uh, people who had myasthenia gravis would not live much more than another, uh, you know, maybe 15 years or so past when, once they've been, uh, uh, diagnosed with that. I was, um, young teenager at the time. And so the doctor said, you know, said to me and my family, you're probably going to, uh, you know, you know, you know, the bad news is that you, you, you'll live till, you know, about 30. And then uh, start to uh, uh, you know slowly die, uh, and so they had medication. They had uh, uh, available medication at that time, uh, py pyridostigmine uh, uh, or mestinon was the, was the name of the drug that I would take. Now, what this mestinon did for me was that basically every day I would get up, and every day I would have a I would be at a different level of uh, stamina energy, strength, things like that. Every day was a little bit different. You know, it was, it was never straight across, straight line across or anything like that. And, and, uh, um, and when I would take the mestinon, the mestinon would help to elevate that a little bit. But as Dr. Tether and the other specialists that they took me to would say, they would say, this mestinon will at best, will at best give you back 70% of a normal person's 100% on all of the, in all of those scales. All right. And, um, and so I was, I was told to, uh, um, to adjust my life accordingly, uh, and to recognize that I was not going to be a runner. I was not going to play baseball. I was not going to play high energy sports. I was no longer going to be doing stuff like that. And I remember, you know, they would, they had brochures and little pamphlets for me and everything that, that said, uh, things like, uh, and the one thing that stood out to me the most, and I still remember to this day is that one of the things said, uh, when you get older, if you, you know, you know, and you start to date, 
you start to go out with girls, make sure that you find, you know, or, or I mean, when you find somebody else, uh, uh, that, that make sure you find somebody who does not need to go do high energy stuff, that you find somebody who is, who is, uh, content with quiet, uh, uh, low, uh, um, energy activities, that type of stuff. And in particular, one statement said, don't look for somebody who likes to dance because that's not good for you, right? <laughs> and and I remember thinking to myself, but what if I want to go dancing? What if I want to dance? And um, and it, it really bothered me for a while uh, because, well, obviously it bothered me for a while because I'm dealing with this thing that's got a uh, death sentence on it. And, uh, and my parents and I uh, managed it as best as we could. And then one night I'm asleep in bed. You can read into this however you want to read into this. I was asleep in bed and I heard a, a voice kind of say to me, uh, uh, um, Steve, what if your what if your 70 percent was equal to another person's 100 percent? And, uh, you know, and I thought that's kind of an odd thing to think about. But, uh, you know, because I was you know, I'm still a kid. Right. So I go and I happened to go see uh, Dr. Taylor that week. Uh, and I said, you know, I just had this crazy thought come into my mind this week. You know, what if I were able to build myself up uh, physically and mentally and maybe spiritually, I guess, uh, emotionally to where I my 70 percent was equal to a normal person's 100 percent. And he looked at me and he said, nobody's ever asked me that question before. Nobody's ever thought of asking that question before. And I said, I said, well, what do you think? And would that be something you would support? And he said, absolutely. He said, absolutely, I would support that. He said, there's no reason not to try to do something like that. So we literally went on a, a created a regimen for me of exercising and, uh, um, you know, um, reading positive material. Uh, I mean, I was reading the books, you know, Think and Grow Rich and, and those types of things long before anybody else, uh, you know, ever, ever, you know, did, it, 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 certainly at my age. And, um, you know, you know, we prayed a lot, honestly, you know, tried to try to make it as positive as we possibly could. The school helped me do it. The coaches helped me do it. They took turns working, uh, you know, having me work out. You know, when I first started, man, I had nothing. I had no gas in the tank at all. You know, I couldn't I couldn't run a quarter mile. Right. Uh, fast forward, you know, a couple of years. And by the time I graduated from high school, I was on the football team, basketball team, on the golf team. I went on to play golf and football in college, uh, went on to do all this sort of stuff. And the point, and the, and, and, uh, and, and then it was a number of years later where literally, uh, they have, um, you know, they, they, they think I still have it, but there's just basically no signs of it. Okay. Uh, and so here I am. I'm 68 years old, gang. Okay. And I'm still, I'm, I'm still kicking. And uh, fortunately, uh, I've got a girl um, sitting in the other office over there right now who uh, likes to dance. And that's what we do. Now, during all of that, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And and it it not only opened my mind, it op I mean, you know, helped my body, helped me physically, helped me mentally and all that sort of stuff. But it also opened me up to being able to recognize other uh, tools that are, are great because I didn't know even when I was doing this, even when I was doing it, even when I was exercising, even when I was working out, even when I was, you know, you know, reading the books, uh, I didn't know how far this was going to help me. I had no idea, but I just, it's what I could do. All right. So what I want to do is I want to share with you seven things that I have learned through my, uh, um, experience with myasthenia gravis. And that I have learned over the years that I that uh, tied in with kind of the same same type of perspective and attitude, and and maybe some of these will resonate uh, uh, re resonate uh, with you right now. So uh, and and after I share these seven things with you, then we'll go in and we'll take a look at some of the questions that you guys have here and and, and see if we can help with that. But hopefully this might give you some 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 stuff. I, I had to write this stuff down, of course, so I need to. I need to double check this. Now, I'm going to um, kick myself off here, and I want to share my screen so that I can, uh, um, let's see. There we go. Okay. All right. So, 
first thing, like I said, is that this is about managing the unknown. All right. And number one, my number one thing in managing the unknown, and and I think I learned to do this when I was a kid, uh, um, but I I it became uh, when I worked for a Japanese toy company, uh, it became much clearer to me, and that was to uh, uh, think and behave short term. Short term, plan, long term. Now, where I where how I learned this from the Japanese was uh, um, was uh, that there are uh, um, they they the, the last company that I worked for the last Japanese company that I worked for they had a one hundred year business plan just like we've all heard right but they but they behaved. While they planned long term and they had these goals out there and they had these objectives out there and every day they were trying to move us, you know, in, in that direction. But on a daily basis, they behaved as, as if tomorrow was going to be a recession. So that's and, and that was something that I thought was really, really huge for me was that was to think and behave short term. And uh, and then, you know, I can plan long term. Right. But I don't, but, you know, they're going to be, you know, things are going to happen. None of us saw this coming along, right? Um, and we can't see the end of this at this, at the moment. We, you know, there are some people who are coming out here and they're saying, yeah, okay, we, you know, this is going to be over in, you know, two weeks or three months or something like that. You know what? We don't know. We can plan for coming out on the other end, but all, but what we, but what we got to do is we've got to do it. We've got to ask ourselves what, you know, how can we, stay alive, stay, you know, feel strong. What can we do today that will help us maybe get through tomorrow? Okay. That's, that's that one. Okay. Uh, number two is to acknowledge pain, acknowledge our pain. Um, you know, allow ourselves to feel the pain. Um, you know, uh, you know, allow ourselves to maybe feel a little bit worried, allow ourselves to feel a little bit depressed, allow ourselves to feel sad, allow ourselves to feel scared, allow ourselves to feel nervous, but set a time limit. Set a time limit. Kay knows I do this. You know, we'll, we'll, you know, over the years, you know, we've had bad things happen to us. Like I, I've had, you know, clients that, you know, we're big money clients and stuff like that, you know, for, for a, a few years. And then all of a sudden out of the blue, they just, they, they said, Oh, we're going to go in a different direction or something like that, you know, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden it's gone, you know, and, and, you know, so for a while I would, I would allow myself to feel unhappy. I would allow myself to feel pissed. I would allow myself to be angry. I would allow myself to, uh, to feel nervous about how am I going to replace that money or something like that. I would allow myself to do that. But that, but, but I would set a time limit. I would say, okay, at six o'clock, I'm done. I'm allowing myself to feel like crap until six o'clock. And then at six o'clock, now I'm, now I have to move into action. All right. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, and, and it's interesting how that works because if you allow yourself to do that, but if you don't, if you don't set a deadline for, for where you say, okay, enough feeling sorry, enough. Now it's time to go from from inaction to action, okay? And um, you know, and then in and then the third one would, which kind of ties in with this, is that I don't. Uh, I, I'm going to say I'll, you know, I limit time with toxic people. And in many cases, I eliminate toxic people from my life. Um, there are always going to be people who pull you down. There are always going to be people, you know, it's the Debbie Downers from Saturday Night Live. You know, they're, they're, they're always going to be people there like that. Um, and, um, you know, but 
all they're going to do is help you to extend your, you know, your inaction part because we freeze when we when we are in that kind of a mode. We freeze. That's why I shut it off. I have a deadline, and then as people come around, and inevitably some, you know, some people do, and they come around and they they start doing the old the old. Oh yeah, but what about the? Oh yeah, but what about the? You know what? And and there's a point where you just have to say, you know what? I don't need to hear this. Okay, I don't need to hear this. I'm moving forward now. Okay, I'm moving forward now. Number four. Where is my number four? Number four. Be an actor. Be an actor. Uh, years ago, you know, we had the uh, WWJD. What would Jesus do? Basically saying to us that in, in certain situations that might be questionable, we, we were supposed to say to ourselves, yeah, well, how about in this, you know, in this situation, how, how would Jesus behave in this? All right. And essentially what that was saying to us was be an actor. See, actors are very good at, uh, becoming somebody else. And actors, uh, are known for, and you, and you know, there are actors who will admit that they sometimes do this themselves. You know, they, that they will, they will be in a, a difficult situation and then they'll say to themselves, well, gee, what would Clint East, you know, what would Dirty Harry do, <laughs> you know, in this? What would, you know, what would, what would, uh, um, uh, John McClane, you know, from Die Hard, how would he, how would he behave? What would Scarlett Johansson do? Uh, uh you know, like, like, how would they be, behave? and you, you know, you sort of tr try to put yourself into that role and you feel yourself. You say, okay, how would they feel? And you feel yourself build your, building yourself up. You feel yourself being more positive, but you're being an actor. All right. Now, if you start to act like you are, you know, this, this is true with a lot of people who are ultimately successful. Is, and they, you know, and you hear this in a lot, in a lot of books that will say, it will say, if you act successfully, ultimately you can become successful. Uh, and that's part of it is that you start to behave the way that type of person would behave. And if you do it long enough, those, those, uh, behaviors become positive, uh, habits. And so you can learn how to, I mean, you can, you can literally walk yourself right into that. In, into that attitude, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to be that actor, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, it, it, and like I said, it doesn't have to be, you, you don't have to follow WWJD. I mean, I've also, you know, I also teach this in, in, with my stealing genius and in, in uncopyable is that, uh, um, yeah, Danny, fake it till you make it. Absolutely right. Uh, you know, you know, and, and, you know, give yourself the opportunity to do that. Right. Uh, um, you know, it, you know, I have very often, uh, you know, teach people to do, to do stealing genius. And so I'll say, well, you know, uh, if you were running your business right now and there's a, and you know what? This is a good exercise for a lot of us right now is if Dis, if Walt Disney were alive today and he were in this situation and he were running your business, what would Walt Disney do? What would Steve Jobs do? You know, what would, um, uh, what's her name? Oops, I'm blanking on the, the pink, the pink, um, woman's products. Okay. Mary Kay. That's what, <laughs> there, Kay. It just rang a bell. Yeah, Mary Kay. What would Mary Kay do? You know, she was in that situation. That's how Mary Kay Cosmetics got, got started. She was, she and her husband would, uh, uh, he, she and her husband were going to start a business and then he died. He died like literally overnight. He died and all of a sudden she's sitting there, you know, at her kitchen table with her son going, what do we do now? And they said, well, we got to go do it ourselves, right? We got to go, go do it ourselves. I don't think Steve Jobs would yell at people in a situation like that. I think Steve Jobs, uh, you know, he looks, he looked for how to, how to, how to fix situations. Okay. So, uh, um, so anyway, so be, be an actor. All right. Number five. Focus on what you can control. What you can control. Focus on your strengths. Don't focus on your weaknesses. Don't focus on what you can't do. If it's something that you can't do, you cannot manage, you cannot control, 
you got to let it go. You got to let it go and get your head going on what you can do, which takes me to number six, which is next step. You know, I teach this as part of the marketing is that, some, you know, is that oftentimes people uh, focus too far ahead in marketing. They're, you know, they start to do a marketing program and they say and they and they start to exercise a marketing program and they st and they start thinking in terms of what the sales are going to be down the road. No, no. Marketing is next step. When you uh, when you send a mailing out to people, the next step is getting them to open the mail. If you send an email blast out to people, the next step is they have to open the email. OK, nothing happens until the next step is done. The very next step. If they don't open the letter, nothing happens. If they don't open your email, nothing happens. Once they open your email, what's the next step? If you're setting up a trade show, if you're working at a trade show, what's 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 the next step? What's what's the first thing that has to happen? People have to stop in your booth, right? If you're an exhibitor at a trade show, the next step is people have to stop. And and then once they stop, what's the next step? So, so, so focus on what you can control and focus on the next step. Okay. And then finally, number seven, help someone. Help someone who needs help. When, um, when I was still being treated for myasthenia gravis, I was I was in my late twenties, and um, I was invited. And Dr. Robert Schuler, who had the Crystal Cathedral down in uh, uh, Garden Grove, California, and he had a weekly TV program called The Hour of Power, and he uh, um, he invited me to come on his program and share my story. And I I came on the program, shared my story. Like I just shared with you, and um, and then afterwards, we were uh, having brunch, and uh, and he said, you know that you're pretty good there, you know, in front of that audience. I mean, there was like four thousand people, you know, in the church uh, while he and I were up there talking, and and he said, you're pretty good. He said, you should think about becoming a professional speaker. I said, a professional speaker? What are you talking about? You mean people? You can get paid to speak? And he goes, oh yeah. Oh yeah, you can you can get paid to speak, right? And I said, "Wow, that's amazing." You know, I had no idea. And see, so here's the thing, you know, and, and you know, and then uh um, you know, and, and also and in the course of the conversations, he's going he he said he says to me, "Look, he says, if you can help someone, if you can help other people with something that you know, something that you can teach, something that you can share, then you owe it to share that. You owe it to help those people. And especially if you're, you know, if you're having difficult times, he says, when, when, when things are going tough, the best thing you can possibly do is go help somebody who needs help. You know, he helped me ultimately to, you know, and introduced me to, uh, uh successful speakers, Brian Tracy, Jim Rohn, uh, um, you know, several others. Uh, and, you know, they helped me to become a successful speaker, you know, and, uh, um, if you know somebody who needs help, it's it, you, uh, you owe it to help them. Because if you can do that, then you do that. Those are the seven things. And one of the things that, you know, when you put it all together, you know, like, like for us, um, you know, I was thinking like, like, what, what's, you know, I love symbols. Everybody loves, you know, you know how much I love symbols that, you know, the color orange and, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, uh, also, let me hear, I can turn this off now. Bring myself back in here. Um, and we've all, we've all heard this, that, uh, you know, is that we should be like a duck. We should be like a duck. You know, if we're going to act, you know, we can, we can act cool and calm on uh, above and we're paddling like crazy underneath, right? We are working like crazy underneath and that's, and, and, you know, is that cool? I got an orange duck, you know, and um, so anyway, so those are the seven things that I've learned over my life about how to manage situations like this and how, how to deal with the unknown. So, so like I said, so those are the seven tips. I hope that uh, those were helpful for you. At least some of them are helpful for you. Uh, if you've got any tips, if you have any ways that you handle 
uh, difficulties or how you are handling the situation right now, you know, please share them in the comments. Uh, and of course you can always email me, uh, let me know, uh, but I'll be very uh, eager to hear. And uh, if you do share something, uh, um, you know, I might share it with other people too, with everybody else. And that would be great. So anyway, so this is Steve Miller, better known as Kelly's dad in marketing gunslinger. Thank you so much for watching this. Uh, we're going to get through this. Uh, I got an email uh, yesterday from uh, a friend of mine in China who said, who has been basically working out of his home for two months who said that things are improving and that they are looking at going back to regular work uh, pretty soon. So there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, let's just hang in there, folks. Let's flatten that curve. Let's, let's do what we need to do to get through this. See ya.